24. Y'all ready? It's hot in here, ain't it? I can, I can promise you hell's hotter. Mm. Y'all ready to dive in? I am too. Listen. <clears throat> when my daughter was a teenager, she was a typical teenager. And we're going to talk about shaking or sifted today. She was a typical teenager in the fact that to wake her up, you couldn't just call her name. You know what I mean? When you went to wake her up every morning, you say, you know, Jill, time to get up. And she might open one eye. And by the time you turned your head, that eye was shut again and she was back to sleep. So to wake her up, you had to physically go lay your hands on her shoulder and shake her. You had to shake her to awake her. And I think that is the truest indication of where church is at today. The church has been asleep, and God has called our names a few times. And we've opened one eye as a church, we've opened one eye, but then as soon as God turns us, we go right back to sleep. We've had those little movements, you know, the little revivals here and the little revivals there and little movements there. But all in all, we've been asleep. Listen, God is shaking his church right now. God is shaking his church right now. I got a little illustration I want to show you. So inside this pan, this is pan our grandkids used to go down the creek and get fool's gold. So inside this pan, I have some rocks and some sand. And I can shake this pan all day long, all day long, but the rocks and the sand don't separate because they're on a solid foundation. They're contained inside a solid foundation. But the minute that solid foundation, the minute that faith gets a little hole in it and it's poured out, The sand separates from the rocks, and all you have left is the rocks. Yeah. Or the church or the house is built upon the rock. The church or house that was built upon the sand has been sifted through. What are you today? Are you going to be a shaken Christian or a sifted Christian? It's up to you. It's up to you. Listen, this, this is tweetable, so get your phones ready, okay? <laughs> Shaking occurs when truth is refused. Sifting occurs when blatant disobedience takes place. Let me read that again. Shaking occurs when truth is refused. Sifting occurs when blatant disobedience takes place. If you got your Bibles with me, would you turn to 1 Kings with me? 1 Kings. We're just going to spend a second here. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. It's on the screen. 1 Kings 18, 21 says, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. The people answered him, not a word. Let me ask you a question. How many of you ever taken a test in school? Yeah. So when you take the test in school, let's say it's a fill in the blank. So you fill that blank in. If you, get, if you put the wrong answer in, it's counted what? We've got a teacher over here. Counted as wrong. If you don't put an answer in that blank at all, it's kind of wrong. The only way to get the right answer and to get credit for that answer is if you put the right answer in, right? So no answer, the people answered him not a word. No answer is an answer. It's a wrong answer. It means they chose Baal instead of choosing God. Listen, many, several years ago, well, let me rephrase that, several decades ago, I forgot how old I was. Several decades ago, I was on vacation down at Myrtle Beach. 
Okay? And we was about four days into the vacation. And I listen, I had had just about all of the laying out on the sand, baking in the sun I could handle. You know what I mean? Any of you guys in here will be saying amen right now. Oh, you know, it's 95 degrees and just all you're doing is laying out there and just baking in the sun. And, oh, it's horrible. So it's about day four in. And if you've ever been to Myrtle Beach, you see these planes that come by. Right, and they have the banner behind them advertising something. Right, usually it says something like, you know, come to Wings and buy 27 T-shirts for ten dollars, or something like that. And you go down to Wings, and they don't have those T-shirts. But that's that's a that's a sermon for another day about deception. So, but this particular day, it said that banner, that plane come by, and that had that advertising banner behind it, and it said, come tour the governor's ho- governor's hotel, receive fifty dollars. Well, listen, by this time, I would not have cared if that banner would have said, come tour Helsinki or Siberia and receive $50. I was going to use any excuse I could to get off that beach. You know what I mean? Come on, men. Amen. You know what I mean? So I told my wife, I said, you know, 40 years ago, $50 was a lot of money. So I told my wife, I said, I think I'm going to go down and check that out. And we can use the $50 that I'm going to get, and I'll take you out for, you know, I try to make it all about her. I'll take you out for a nice, you know, seafood dinner later. And, uh, of course, $50 right now, you probably couldn't buy enough seafood for one person. But anyway, back then, it was a lot of money. So here I go. I go down to the governor's hotel. I don't even know if it's still at Myrtle Beach or anymore or not. But uh, anyway, so I go down to the governor's hotel, and I go walking in. And, of course, it's a timeshare, right? Okay, it's a timeshare. So the guy that met me, I'll never forget his name. The guy's name was Larry. <laughs> y'all, got, y'all got, come on, emphasize how I'm saying it. His guy, this guy's name was Larry. So I walk in, and Larry says, we're so glad you came down. What's your name? And he immediately starts, you know, I tell him my name. He immediately starts doing a bio on me. How old are you? Do you own your home? You know, where do you work? What do you do? What's your annual income? You know, so he's writing all this down. Super nice guy. Larry is super nice at this time. And uh, then he says, you know, he shows me all the brochures for the timeshare for the unit itself and uh, shows me a video and and then takes me on a tour throughout the hotel and takes me back to the room and, you know, shows me the price breakdown. And then here comes the sales pitch. Any of y'all? Y'all have heard the sales pitch, right? So here comes the sales pitch. Now, Mr. Loggins, don't you think this is too good of a deal to turn down? I mean, this guy's good. He's been through all the sales schools. You know, he, he knows just the right words to say. Don't you think this is too good of a deal to turn down? I look at Larry, and I say, well, maybe it is, but I'm going to think about it. So Larry was good. He'd been through training. He said, now, Mr. Loggins, you told me, when we was filling out your bio, that your supervisor, which means you're used to making quick, good decisions, so, so why, don't you think you can make a good decision today? I said, Larry, Larry. I said, Larry, I have decided. I have decided I'm going to think about it. So Larry, like most salesmen, he doesn't take no for an answer very easily. Uh, so I keep telling him no, no, no. Finally to the point where Larry says, okay, Mr. Loggins, this, this offer is only going to be available for so long. Get your drink. He brought me a Diet Coke. Get your drink. Throw your trash on the way out. So he was basically done with me at this time. Okay. But Larry was nice up until then. Well, let me tell you what. I didn't give Larry an, an-, an answer. That's not a choice with God. That is not a choice with God. No answer with God is a choice. But... Have no fear, true child of God, because through the shaking, there's coming a glory in God's house. Let's go to Haggai, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time. Haggai chapter 2. If you got your Bible, Haggai chapter 2. If you don't know where it's at, go to the end of the Old Testament, back up three books, and you'll be there. <laughs> Old Testament, back up three books, and you'll be there. Haggai chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 9. I'm going to read them through in their entirety, and then we're going to go back through and dissect and digest them, Okay. All right, it says, In the seventh month, on the 21st of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? 
In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth and the sea and dry land. And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temp- temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this letter, the glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. So let's go back and digest and dissect this and break it down a little bit. We'll pick up in verses 2 and 3. Let's go, let's go back to verses 2 and 3. It says, speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who is left among you? Who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? We have any sores in here? We got anybody that sews their own clothes? I know that's kind of a, I know that's kind of a gone by uh, area where people don't sew their own clothes, but if I ask you what a remnant is, what are you going to tell me? What's a remnant? Leftover. A remnant is something that's left over. It's a piece that's left over. Okay? Most people don't think remnants are, you know, are worth anything. And then verse 3, it says, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is this not in your eyes as nothing? Look around. I want you to look around this morning. Four months ago, this sanctuary was full, full of people. Now we have remnants. We have remnants. We have only those people who have stayed, those faithful, chosen remnants who have stayed. Down through generations... God has used a remnant of people to make a difference. He used 12 men to change the world. A small remnant of people. In our eyes, it may not look like anything today compared to what it was. But in God's eyes, it's an opportunity for a miracle. It's an opportunity for him to show out. Because see, when this house was full... We could pull things off and we could do things on our own. Now, we can't do it without God. It takes God. Verse 4, I want you to look at verse 4 for a minute. Verse 4 says, Yet now now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people, Lord, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. Work. For I am with you, says Lord of hosts. Look what that verse starts with. Starts with the letter yet. Is yet a word that you see in the Bible very often? No. What's the word you usually see there in the Bible? When he's making a comparison between two things, what word is, is usually used in the Bible? Come on, we got some English teachers in here. But. But when, you, when he's in the Bible, typically when a comparison is being made between two different contrasts, The word but is used, okay? But in this case, the word yet is used. Let me show you the difference. There's a difference in every dot, every every thing that's in the Bible. There's a difference. But shows a contrast. Yet shows a very surprising contrast. Listen, it would be a surprise to the city of Anderson if Rejuvenate Church that currently has, I don't know, 70 people, 75 people sitting in here, made a difference it'd be very surprising if a church of 
250 made a difference? Eh, maybe not. So surprising. So that would be a but church. I'm ready to be a yet church. I'm ready to be a yet church. I'm ready to be a not, I'm not, don't want to be a but church. I'm ready to be a yet church. Verse 5. Verse 5 talks about according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Listen, I'm glad he used the word covenant here. Okay, instead of promised. Now, you're going to say, Tom, you're getting sacrilegious because anytime God makes a promise, it comes true. Anytime God makes a direct promise, it comes through. But there are things in the Bible called provisional promises that we'll get to in just a little while that depend on, upon us to come true. But this is a covenant. So what this means is it's going to happen. God covenanted with you. It don't matter what happens. It don't matter if hell turns upside down. It's going to happen. So he says that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. What was happening in Egypt? The plagues. When God, when the, the people of Israel were in Egypt and God wanted to bring them out, man, there were locusts, there were frogs, there were famine, there was peasants, there was firstborn people dying. All this was going on around the Israelites, but it wasn't affecting the Israelites. Y'all didn't get that. Because if y'all got that, y'all would have y'all would have done like Christie's doing. All that stuff was going on around the Israelites. They were right in the middle of Egypt when all that stuff was going on. And it was going on all around them, right among their midst. But it wasn't affecting them. Listen, y'all hear me. I take extra precautions when I go out in public. I wear a mask. I do things that you're supposed to do. Okay? But I'm going to tell you what. This is not going to be good English, but that's okay. There ain't no mask going to protect you like the full armor of God. So instead of depending upon that mask to protect you, why don't you put on the full armor of God and be protected? That's what the Israelites had. They had the full armor of God. Verse 6 says, For, for thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land. Is there anybody in here today that doubts that we're being shaken? Is this world being shaken today? Man, if you just go back and look at chron uh, chronological order of just the year 2020, everything that's happened, it will blow your mind. We're being shaken like we've never been shaken before. But... God, but God. Verse 7 says, and I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The desire of all nations. What do all nations desire? Peace. It's exactly right. I mean, you think about it. Any, any beauty pageant you've ever been to, when they've asked the contestant, you know, what do you want to see happen in the world? It's always world peace. I want to see world peace. I want to see world peace. Countries... Every, everybody desires peace. As a matter of fact, countries desire peace so much, they'll go to war to try to get peace. I mean, I mean, they will, right? They'll go to war to try to get peace. Who's the prince of peace? Jesus is the prince of peace. And he's going to fill the temple with his glory of what the nation is desiring, and that's peace. And then verse 8 says, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Basically, what he's telling you here is everything is his. Everything starts with him and ends with him. He's the, he's the first and last, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, who was, who is, and who is to come. He's the Mac Daddy and the bag of chips. He's it. He's it. It's him. The first nine says, the glory, listen, y'all, this ought to make you shout. This ought to make you shout. It says, the glory of this latter temple, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. 
Man, he will give peace. He will give peace. Listen, several years ago, James W. Moore wrote a bestseller book entitled, Standing on the Promises or Sitting on the Premises. Anybody in here ever read that book? Standing on the Promises or Sitting on the Premises. And in this book, uh, James W. Moore talks about the difference between those Christians who are truly standing on the promises, those Christians in church who are truly standing on the promises, and those that are just sitting on the premises. And the difference is those that are standing on the promises claim, embrace, and are invested in the promises of God. Where those sitting on the premises sit lifelessly and listlessly on the edge of the church with a half-hearted devotion. The standers discover the true richness and fullness of God intends for their lives. And the sitters are tossed to and fro by circumstances and emotion. Tossed to and fro by circumstances and emotions. Do I have your permission to get on the soapbox for just a minute? Oh, okay, Cliff, you gave me permission. That means that means y'all can't get mad at me. You can get mad at Cliff. Cliff gave me the permission, but you can't get mad at me, okay? All right. And this is not directed toward anyone who's had COVID, anyone who's been exposed to those people that had COVID. You should have quarantined two weeks. We want you to quarantine two weeks. The doctors want you to quarantine two weeks. Go for it. You should do that. We want you to do that. And I'm not trying to diminish COVID at all. Y'all, COVID is real. COVID is real. People are catching COVID. People are dying from COVID. I'm not trying to diminish that. Here's what I am trying to diminish. We're probably missing 175 people out of church this morning. So this is directed toward those people who have used the COVID virus as an excuse to divorce from church. They'll go to the grocery store. They'll go to their favorite restaurants and eat. They'll go to the lake. They'll go to the beach. And I'm telling you, God only knows they'll go to Home Depot because you can't, you, you can't hardly get in Home Depot right now. But they won't come to church. I don't understand it. I don't understand. Listen, as one of those people who has one of those underlying health conditions that they tell you to, that you need to be more careful about I take precautions I wear my mask and stuff and I go in stores and I try to maintain the social distancing but y'all I'll be doggone that's a good sermon a good southern term I'll be doggone if I'm gonna allow COVID to make me quit living you know there's an old saying that says I'd rather hurt to have loved and lost than not have loved at all well, I'd rather to have lived and lost than not to have lived at all. I'm going to live. I'm not going to let this lock me down. I'm not going to let this take me away from church. I'm not going to let this take me away from church. It says, forsake not assembling of the brothers. Where are you at? TV. Y'all watching from TV. You should be here. We love you watching from TV. We love you watching from TV, especially if you can't be here. We understand you, some of you can't be here. But those that can, shame on you. <laughs> Pastor Jason may never let me preach again. <laughs> Listen, y'all. Listen, y'all. None of this should surprise us, right? None of this should surprise us. None of what's going on in the world today should surprise us. If we read our Bible and we know our Bible, what's ex happening is exactly what he told us would happen. It's exactly what he told us happened. Matter of fact, we're going to go to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, we're going to start in chapter 2, verse 1. 
And for you to understand what's going on in Revelation, you have to understand the breakdown of Revelation. In Revelation, it's broken down in three parts. Chapter 1 is things that happened in the past. Chapters 2 and 3 are things that are presently happening, present day. And then chapters 4 and on are things that will happen in the future. So today we're going to focus on things that are happening in the present. In the present. So we're going to pick up with chapter 2, verse 1. And as we read through these... Here's the question I want you to ask yourself. Which one of these churches or people that, that Christ is talking to here do you most resemble? It says, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have that you hate. Man, it, that's strong language. That's strong. This is strong. Hate. And you know, this is coming from God. Strong language. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And we'll talk a little bit in, a little, in just a little while about what, Nic what the Nicolaitans are. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is, a, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Did you identify with any of that? Most, most of the church of Ephesus, he's patting on the back and he's saying, y'all doing a good job, you've persevered, you've stayed strong, you know, you kept your head above water, you, you, you're, you're working, you'll continue to walk on, but, here comes that but. Remember I said you don't want to be a but church. I want to be a yet church. So there comes that but where he says, but this I have against you. Some of you have lost your first love. Do a self-examination right now. Have you lost your first love? But all in all, I'd still rather be this church than I'd rather be the next church. The next church we're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 2. Verse 12. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. We'll read 12 through 17. It says, To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has a sharp two edged sword. Who has the two edged sword? Jesus. Jesus. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you have... You ha also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What did he say to the other church about the Nicolaitans? Which thing I hate. He hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. It says, repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. And I will give him a white stone and on stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it? Let's talk about the Nicolaitans a little bit this morning. Let's find out why God hated what they were teaching, what the Nicolaitans were teaching. First of all, to understand this, you have to understand that the word Nicolaitans is, is derived from the great Greek word Nikolaos. Nikolaos, okay? And this is a compound of Nikos, it's a compound word of Nik Nikos and Laos, okay? And the Greek word... For Nikos, in the English language, means subdue. So Nik Nikos means subdue. Laos, the English translation for the Greek word Laos, is the people. Y'all didn't get that. 
Nicolaitans subdue the people. Subdue the people. Uh, since y'all don't believe in Greek, we'll, tell you, we'll break it down to Webster's Dictionary a little bit. You know what Webster's dic- Dictionary for subdue is? Bring a person or country under control by coercion, coercion or force. So let me reread that. So the Nicolaitans were bringing a person or country under control by cohesion or force. They were subduing the people. Y'all ain't getting this. I'm telling you, church, we're being subdued. We're being coerced. We're bringing brought under control. Listen. When you live in a country that tells you it's okay to go everywhere else, but you can't have singing at church. Do y'all not think we're being subdued? Do y'all not think we're being coerced? And then, so, so the person that's teaching all this during this time is actually, his name is Nicolaus of Antioch. And what he's teaching is the church needed to compromise and let some of the black magic beliefs that the government held be accepted in the church. What? What? The government is trying to bring everything into the church. The government is trying to become the church. They're trying to subdue the church. We got to wake up. As a church, we have to wake up. Listen, I talked earlier about a covenant versus a contract. So, and I told you that a contract, even if it's from God, even if it's one of God's promises, for it to come true, some of his promises we have to act on. That's actually called a provisional contract. Okay? In legal terms, it's called a provisional contract. Okay? So I won't get to that in just a minute. My wife and I, the other night, we were watching a movie. It's called Coach Carter. Anybody in here ever saw that? Okay. True story about a uh, high school basketball coach in 1999 in California that went back to his old high school to coach the team, the boys' basketball team. Well, the year before, the boys' basketball team had won four games and lost 22 games. When he gets there, he finds a true lack of discipline, He finds a true lack of dedication to the team. It's all about themselves. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to shoot the ball when I want to shoot the ball. I'm going to play defense when I want to play defense. So day one, what does he do? He gives them a provisional contract to sign. And that provisional contract says, I will give you the right to play basketball on our boys' basketball team if... If then, if you do some things, if you maintain a 2.3 grade point average, if you attend your classes, if you sit on the front row. Now listen, this was a high school that typically, y'all, I didn't say sent less than 50% of the people to college. This is a high school that graduated less than 50% of their students. Graduated less than 50% of their students. And naturally, some of the basketball players on that team didn't sign the contract and walked off the team. But some of them did sign it. And so through hard work and hard practice and discipline and dedication, listen, they started out and won their first 16 games that season. Man, things were going good. But he got that first progress report from the teachers about those basketball players. Remember, they'd signed that contract, okay? They weren't maintaining 2.3 grade point averages. They weren't sitting on the front rows. As a matter of fact, they weren't even going to class, a lot of them. So what does he do? He went down. You seen it, Cliff? He went down and locked the gym. Locked the gym. 
They were 16 and 0, y'all, ranked in the top 10 in the state. He went down and locked the gym. You know where he held the next practice at? In the library. He held the next practice in the library, and all those students started to come to the library. He, gym locked, you can't go in there. He canceled games. He canceled games. Man, forfeited games, and they were 16 and 0, and he was canceling games. But in the end, he made a difference. Six, six boys off that team, half that team received college scholarships either for academics or athletics. He made a difference, and he made them live up to that contract they had signed. See, he was more worried about winning in life than it was about winning on the court. Now, y'all clap for that. But you probably won't clap for what I'm getting ready to tell you. God gave us an if-then, a provisional contract in the Bible. In fact, we'll turn to it now. It's a very familiar scripture you're used to. Second Chronicles chapter 7, beginning with verse 14. Second Chronicles chapter 7, beginning with verse 14. It says, if my people, if, provisional contract, provisional promise, if... My people who are called by name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And all the people said, Amen. But we stop here. We stop at verse 14. I love verse 15. I love verse 15. It says, Now my eyes will open. And my ears attended to prayer made in this place. Provisional contract. We have to do something for God to hear us. We have to do something for God to heal our land. We have to do something for God to hear our prayers about this land. Listen, verse 14 says, if... You can't spell the word if without I, right? You got to have an I to spell the word if. That means I, you, me, us. We have to be invested. We have to be invested in the movement for the mover to want to move to the movement. I think I got that right. We have to be invested in the movement for the mover to make a move for the movement. It's a contract, y'all. Not only will some of us not show up to class, and I know I'm preaching to the choir this morning because you're here, okay? Not only will some of us not show up to church, we certainly won't sit on the front row. And we're certainly not maintaining that grade that God expects us to maintain. So, Danny, you're a teacher, right? 2.3 GPA is a C, a C plus. You know, it's, it's average. 2.3 is average. We won't even maintain average. Average. Y'all know how much difference we can make in this world if the church just maintained average? So here's my question for you today. Are you shaken or are you shifted? When you have a little doubt in your faith, are you like that sand that just everything flows through? Oh, I'm not going to go to church. I'm afraid I'll get sick. You may. You may get, have a wreck on the way to church and not make it to church. But 
you may come to church and get delivered. Like I said, I'm not going to allow the junk that's going on in the world to turn my back on my life, and I'm certainly not going to allow it to turn my back on his life. Aren't y'all glad when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane that he wasn't worried about the bugs or the stuff that may be going on around him? He had a purpose and a plan. You do too. You got a purpose and a plan. Quit allowing the bugs and the dirt and stuff going on around you. Quit allowing that to derail your plan for your life. So here's what we're going to do. Praise team's not going to come back up. We're going to play some music. And those of you that want to go, you're dismissed. I'll pray a prayer dismissal in just a moment. You can go. Those of you that want to pray for your country, those of you that want to be the if part of the contract, and see our land change and our country change, then this altar is open to you. Father, bless them. Bless them and their coming and their going. Father, give us the boldness. Father, give us the same boldness to come to church that you give us to go to Home Depot. Father, one of the churches that you wrote to that I didn't even talk about this morning was a church at Laodicea that said you would spew them out of their mouth because of their lukewarmness. Mm. Forgive us of our lukewarmness. Forgive us of our average. Father, I'm so glad you weren't average. Mm. I'm so glad that you went above and beyond in everything that you did. Nothing stopped you from your purpose. Nothing stopped you from your plan. Nothing that man tried to do. Nothing that government tried to do. Nothing that Satan tried to do. Nothing that hell tried to do. Nothing stopped you from your purpose. Father, forgive us for quitting so easy. Bless them as they go. In your name we pray.